Uh, hi, everyone. Today, um, we have a very special guest on the show, Dr. Emmanuel Budajij of the University of Malta. Um, we're going to talk about the siege of Candia, as well as the uh, the ongoing war that uh, precipitated it. It's, I think, a you were saying, Emmanuel, a 24-year-long siege or something? That's got to be yeah, one of the longest like in history. <laughs> Well, yeah, it, it's it's a very, very long conflict. Uh, mm. Of course, they weren't fighting all the time, but mm. it does drag out for nearly 24 years. And mm. it's, uh, it's not one of the best known wars um, mm. in, in general European history, but it was a war that did in, involve, you know, so many different people. Uh, it really was part of the wider complicated tapestry of, of Europe in those years. So I think mm. it does merit its its attention. Definitely, definitely. Um, And before we get started, can... You maybe just give a bit of information about your background and uh, how you came to be studying this, uh, your interest mm -hmm. in this, and, and so sure. forth. Sure. So I should premise by saying that I'm not a military historian, really, uh, but I do study an organization that is the Knights of Malta, or the Knights of St. John, uh, who were a military religious organization. Uh, now, for my PhD, which I did in, at the University of Cambridge a couple of years back, um, I was very interested in looking at how this group of men negotiated their masculinity uh, because they were a very particular group in the wider tapestry of, 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 of Europe in those days. Uh, and of course, war was very important in how they defined themselves as men, as knights, as religious knights. That, that is the key here. Uh, and then since then, I've been looking at different aspects of, of their history, their story, and at the moment, I'm in fact engaged in writing a book on their military exploits in the 17th century. And that is how I've come about now to know a bit more about the War of Candia, uh, the Battle of the Dardanelles, about which we're going to speak together, and, uh, and its protagonist, uh, Carafa, who, who was one of these larger-than-life characters. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it sounds... Um, I'm, I'm ready to hear about it. So... I, I... I think when we started talking about it originally, you mentioned maybe we should split this into different sections. So the first section I'd really like to hear about is the, the background and how we, how we got up to this point. Sure. Um, so when we're talking about the War of Candia, Candia was the name uh, in the 17th century for the island of Crete. So we're talking about the island of Crete, which is, of course, part of Greece today. Um, and the war itself started in 1645 and would end in 1669. So as we said, about 24 years. Now, um, what's the background to this? So the background is that in the east of the Mediterranean, you have the Ottoman Empire, um, which of course you, you did talk about yourself when you had the podcast about the siege of Malta. Um, the Ottoman Empire, its heyday was the 16th century when you had the siege of Malta of 1565. But in the 17th century, it is still arguably the largest single political unit in the Mediterranean and probably in Europe too. Um, you know, its land stretch across the Balkans, the Middle East, much of North Africa. Um, but there were these few small places in the Eastern Mediterranean that were still not under its control. One of them was the island of Crete, which was controlled by Venice. Again, Venice's heyday was earlier, but still in the 17th century, it, it did control a bit of an empire uh, across the Mediterranean. And um, among these, the, the, their prized possession was the island of Crete. Earlier, they had even held Cyprus, which was even larger and, and more significant, but they had lost that about 100 years, 100 years before to the Ottomans. Can, so, can you tell me sense, why? Could you tell me why Crete was such a prized mm -hmm. possession? Sure. Um, there were two reasons. There was the practical, the fact that they controlled this quite a large island um, with um, you know, not a lot of resources, but it does have its own resources that they could exploit. And, of course, uh, its position. You know, the, the place where it is was very convenient for Venice to be able to carry on uh, its commerce and its trade. Remember that Venice thrived on having this very complicated relationship with the Ottomans. On the one hand, they are the enemy because they are Muslim, but on the other hand, they are Venice's major trading partner mm. through which Venice gets the spices of the East and other such products, which were the bedrock of the wealth of Venice. And then there was the symbolic importance, the symbolism of 
a Christian power still holding on to a territory in the east, which was uh, overwhelmingly controlled by 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 the Ottomans. Um, so so that that was its importance. Really. Fair enough. So really, what you have is these two protagonists: uh, the Ottomans on the one hand and Venice on the other, and then the Knights of Malta, the Hospitallers, or the Knights of Saint John. They come with many names, who are the ones who arguably cause uh, the spark that ignites the whole the whole the whole war. Fair enough. So could you tell me about the, that spark? <laughs> yes, and that is a fascinating episode in itself. So. The Knights of Malta are based in Malta, as the name implies. Um, they had been there, so we're talking 1644. They had been there since 1530 now, so more than 100 years. They had survived the siege of 1565. And uh, as time went by, they really became more and more sophisticated in the way they operated with their navy. They never had a large navy, and at most, uh, they might have. St- something between six to eight galleys and and that was rare to have more than six really but this navy was incredibly efficient um and every year at the beginning of or end of spring beginning of summer they would set out from malta towards the levant the east um basically to to pillage raid um the, all, all, all the coasts that were under the Ottoman uh, Empire, which was a lot, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and Ottoman or Muslim, Muslim shipping. So in uh, 1644, um, a, 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 a fleet sets out from Malta. Uh, there were about six galleys. They were under the command of a French knight of, of Malta. He had a rather long name. I'll try and get it right. <laughs> so he was Gabriel the Sham Wa Wadra. Um, that is long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my French is not too brilliant, I'm afraid. So apologies to our French listeners. Um, they, they set out from Malta. They head into the, the, the east um, in, in, in er, sort of midsummer of 1644. Now, as they're sailing around, uh, it hadn't been a very eventful trip. Um, so they are really coming to the end of their journey in the east. But then on the 28th of September of 1644, uh, when they were near the island of Rhodes, which perhaps as your listeners might know had been their home before Malta, um, they spot a convoy of Ottoman ships, about 10 of them, near Rhodes. Most of these ships were very small, but there was one which was really, really big. In fact, they call it the Gran Galeone, that is the Great Galley. And uh, the the Hospitaller Maltese fleet, as was their habit, decided to to attack this this convoy. In particular, they really wanted to go for this galleon because they 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 realized that being so big it it must have been a significant prize to 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 catch. Uh, now, it's worth saying a word about the nature of, of how this kind of fighting uh, took, took place. So the, the knights had galleys. Galleys are, uh, they have both rowers and uh, sail it, um, sails, but really their, their, their key uh, power uh, was, was in the rowers. So mostly they, they depended on rowers, many of them slaves, Muslim slaves. Uh, so it's, it's literally muscle power, no, on, on, on the benches. Very, very tough work. Um, the galley tended to be small and quite low-lying, quite, quite near the, the, the water level, uh, and quite crammed as well. It's really packed with, with men on board. It really depended on speed. It had some cannon and guns, which were usually at the front of, of the galley, what, what, you, what we call the pro or the bow. And so if you wanted to fire these guns, you needed to get the whole galley facing frontwards towards towards your enemy. So maybe to help our listeners, this is not what you see in Master and Commander, no? (laughs) Where the guns are on the side. The broad side, right? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. No, these have their guns at the front. You have to turn the whole thing to be able to shoot. And usually the strategy was that they had to be really good to do this to get into position, 
get into enough of a range where your guns can cause enough damage to the enemy. That gives you the time then to row up to the enemy's vessel and board it. That was the real strength of the galley, that the men actually board the enemy vessel and physically you want to overpower mm. your, your enemy. So this is what they do on that occasion. You know, they get really close to the enemy vessels, especially the, the Gran Galeone, and, and, and carry out this procedure. The Galeone is a galley. So that is a bit like the ones you see in Master and Commander. So a vessel with different uh, decks. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite high, especially mm -hmm. compared to the galleys, and has more firing power as well. So it's two pieces of, of slightly different technology that are, that are clashing um, together. There's a ferocious battle of, that lasts a couple of hours. In the end, the knights prevail, as they often tended to do. <laughs> um, so they manage to sink one of the smaller vessels. They capture another of the smaller vessels. And importantly, they capture the Great Galleon. Uh, the other Ottoman vessels managed to, to get away. But, you know, that, that was a very satisfactory outcome. Mm, mm. Uh, can I, just, um, can yeah. I, can I just, just quickly ask, the, the pivot from the, temp, the Knights Hospitala being this land-based power that you kind of envision in plate armor to more or less kind of pirates in a way, was that a very gradual transition, do you think? Or is that, um, to that well, out of circumstances? Yeah, yeah, you know, by this point, 1644, uh, they had long been maritime warriors. Right. Uh, that transition had started about, um, what would it be, two, three hundred years earlier mm -hmm. when they had first moved to Rhodes. Right. So when they, had, when they were forced out of the Holy Land and they found Rhodes as their new home. And of course, because they were on an island, they really had to make the transition from being knights with armor on horses to being uh, maritime warriors, essentially, mm. with, 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 with their galleys. Mm -hmm. So by this point that we're talking about, they're, they're very experienced. Um, and of course, they have crews, many of them Maltese, but also from many other places, um, who were real um, sea dogs, mm. who really knew, who knew their stuff. So as I said, it's a small navy, but they prided themselves in the, in the high skill of the men that they could operate with. Sure, sure. Now, the battle that we're talking about was so violent that, among others, the Captain General, um, Gabriel de Chambre, I'll just go with a shortened name now, <laughs> uh, he himself dies in, in, in the confrontation. Um, but the galleon was such a rich price that it, it was really sort of worth the sacrifice that, that, that they had to um, endure. Now, the descriptions we have of the galley and what they found on it uh, are quite detailed. I would allow for an element of hyperbole or exaggeration, but clearly this was a very rich price. We're told that it was full of gold, silver, diamonds, and a lot of very fine fabrics. Wow. Now, to us this might sound a bit odd, but you know, in a pre-industrial society, fabric really fetched a lot of money, especially fabrics that came from the East, which were often of a much higher quality and finesse than what you could get back in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this was amazing. Plus, of course, any Muslims they captured became their slaves. Uh, you know, the galley was a consuming machine. You, you could only serve as a rower for a couple of years, probably. Uh, so they always needed new slaves in order to keep powering their, their war machine. So this, this is, it's very brutal, but, but that's how it worked. Now, what's interesting in this instance is that uh, among the slaves that they captured on the galleon, there were a few women. Usually, no, most of them would be men on, 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 on the ships. But in this case, there were a few women who did look like they were of a certain kind of high social standing. And there was a boy, a young boy, probably about only two years old. And it was clear that the others around him, the, the other Muslims on the ship, um, treated him with certain reverence. And so immediately there were questions about who this boy might be. Now, quite quickly, the narrative that develops is that this boy was called Osman, 
and that he was a son of none other but the Ottoman Sultan himself. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Sultan at that point was Ibrahim. And again, the story that, that, that developed was that this Osman was not just a son, but the firstborn of Sultan Ibrahim. Wow. So, yeah, this was absolutely sensational. Mm, mm. You know, you're saying, I don't know, in the current Russia-Ukraine conflict that somehow the Ukrainians captured the daughter of Putin. Or this. No, that, it, <laughs> yeah, it's, that, it's that, that kind of uh, story. Um, the Sultan Ibrahim, when he hears of what has happened, um, has an absolutely livid reaction. Um, and immediately it's clear that he's going to mobilize a significant force to avenge himself. And the fact that he mobilizes and is so angry about this whole episode seems to justify the idea that they had managed to capture a child of his, possibly even um, the, the, the firstborn. Having said all this, already at the time, there were people who were quite skeptical about the identity of this boy, of Osman. Um, and today, generally, scholars agree that he must not have been the firstborn. He might have been a child of, of the Sultan, but quite unlikely that he was the firstborn. Mm. Um, but still, you know, just like today, there's news and fake news. Um, and uh, governments then and now can spin stories which they understand have, have a potential. Um, what happens to Osman is that the Pope, among others, realizes that, that this can be a very good candidate to sow dissent in the Ottoman Empire itself. If the, if, if the papacy can present him as an alternative candidate to the Sultan or, 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 or his, his heirs, maybe that might rally people in the Ottoman Empire around this alternative figure. Uh, you know, and if maybe, and I, I, I think they were being a bit fantastical here, but if he gets the throne and he owes the throne to the Pope and the Knights, of course, that would change completely the whole political dynamic. Uh, so, you, so you see where, where, where they were going mm. with that. Mm. Now, we don't have much time to delve in his story, which is, is fascinating in itself. Um, he, he stays in Malta for a couple of years. Uh, in 1656, he's baptized, so he becomes a Catholic, uh, and he takes a, a, a new name, a Christian name. He's called Domenico di San Tommaso, so Dominic of St. Thomas, a, a thoroughly, thoroughly Catholic name. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, uh, the, the baptism, we have a beautiful description of it. It, it, it was, was phenomenal. There was music, there were rituals, a lot of symbolism. Uh, all the top people of the island were, were in attendance because, of course, uh, you know, you don't get a Muslim prince mm. like that every day, of course. Mm. You know, whether he was or not didn't quite matter. But, you know, it, it, it's just the image that, that, that really mattered. Uh, there's a beautiful line in one of the documents that describes this. And I'll just read it to you out in English. Uh, so they say that this fresh flower, referring to him, has, to be, has today been planted in the garden of the Holy Church, so that, preserving and augmenting the gift he received today through baptism, he will inspire the odor of heroic virtues that will deserve eternal life. Wow, that is very it's, eloquent indeed. <laughs> it is, it is. It's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and it tells you, of course, the kind of currency that this boy and then young man um, kind, of, kind of offered. Um, but I think we can leave Osman or Domenico here mm. and, uh, and maybe now move to, to the next part, uh, which would be the reaction of the Ottomans and the reaction in Malta to, to this. What do you think? Yeah, I'm happy to. I, I was going to ask you if you could you elaborate a little more on the, I guess, the political fabric of Europe at this time? Was there any, any major wars across the continent? Was the papacy... Um, heavily involved in the Mediterranean, or were they looking elsewhere? Or mm -hmm. so um, it, it's quite a particular moment because we said this happens in 1644, the capture of the galleon. Um, Europe was really at the end of what we call the Thirty Years' War. Uh, 
Now, for a historian, I'm really bad at dates, but <laughs> 30 Years' War ends in 1646, 48, if I recall correctly. No, but it ends in the 1640s. And you don't have any major war quite immediately because the Thirty Years' War was so exhausting. But you do have sporadic conflicts here and there. And war was practically an everyday occurrence, mm. no, for most people, un unlike what we generally have been used to mm. in the last sort of seven decades or so. Hoping that doesn't change. Mm. Um, so this episode kind of comes at a moment where much of Europe is about to, 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 to conclude that very traumatic uh, experience, which was the Thirty Years' War. And it's going to have a slight moment of peace before other conflicts are going to erupt. Um, and that allows the papacy, among others, to kind of shift its, its gaze a bit more away from northern Europe towards the Mediterranean. Um, it also allows a power like France, for example, which had been, again, quite busy with the Thirty Years' War, um, to renew its interest uh, in the Mediterranean. France itself was emerging from a couple of years of difficult uh, political confrontation. Um, and really, whereas in the previous century, in the 16th, Spain had been the major Christian power in the Mediterranean, now one could call it the French century, that the France would be much more significant. Right. But what you also have, which is fascinating, is a strong presence by the Dutch and the English. Uh, what in, in the literature are often called the Northern Invaders. Uh, the English and the Dutch are much more interested in trade than war, although occasionally they will have conflicts with, with Ottomans and with Muslims, but mostly they try and avoid it. And of course, as Protestants, uh, they're not really interested in supporting mm. Catholic initiatives. Mm. So, you know, broadly speaking, that, that is the picture that you have uh, in the 1640s and for much of the of the years that the War of Candia unfolds. Okay. In, in fact, what you have in the War of Candia on Crete is that a lot of men, soldiers, who had been occupied in the Thirty Years' War, a lot of mercenaries, when that war ended, found themselves unemployed. That is the nature of a mercenary, no? Peace mm. is not good for you. <laughs> Um, and what happens is that a lot of these men, when they realize that there is this new and as it turns out, long conflict on Crete, they will offer their services um, to Venice, because that was the, the main party interested. Um, but also the knights sometimes employ some of these men. Um, and um, I believe some of them also found themselves in the service of the Ottomans. After all, if you're a soldier, you go where, where you're going to get the best pay. Of course, pay of course. Most of the time. So... In a way, that's why this conflict is fascinating, because you're going to see people from all kinds of backgrounds sucked into it and involved in it uh, mm. in, in many, 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 many different ways. For sure, for sure. Yeah, let's, um, let's, let's hear about it then. <laughs> okay, so um, again, that, that battle happened in September 1644. Um, the squadron then sails to Malta. Uh, it was victorious, as we said, but of course, when you come out of a battle like that, it means your galleys are damaged. It means you've lost men who have died fighting and you have a lot of wounded people. So, And of course, they're carrying all this uh, booty and mm. prize that they've captured. And they were really keen on towing to Malta the galleon. Uh, and again, these were fabulously interesting operations when you have these galleys with rowers that are tied with ropes to this gigantic vessel and they're rowing <laughs> to pull it to, to, towards the island. I mean, it's... it's, it's Is this impressive. more of a, a propaganda piece to be towing this humongous Absol ship back? Absolutely. You know, they really wanted to bring it to Malta, to show it to the Grand Master, mm. the head of the order, to show it to the people. There were instances before and after where they had done this and where these uh, big ships uh, would be would be sort of placed the prominent positions in the island for mm. a couple of years as, as a you know the, the ultimate prize of course sometimes they would also refit them to use them themselves it really depended on the condition of the of the ship mm -hmm. and and what what their needs were 
Um, now, what happens is that as they're sailing towards Malta, they decide to stop on Crete, which was Venetian. They stop there to get water and supplies, uh, but they stop there without the permission of the Venetians, which, which is critical. So Venice didn't, didn't allow them to do this, but they did it anyway, mm. as they often did. <laughs> um, having stopped there and resupplied, then they proceeded to Malta, and they would finally reach Malta on the 3rd of November, 1644. So you see how long it took as yeah. well. Uh, yeah two months, or well, a month and wow. a half. Um, again, we have to remember that in a pre-industrial world, even war had to follow the rhythms of nature. So the winds and the currents and, and, and all, all, all that, which sometimes we, we forget. Um, as they were near the, the coast of South Italy and the east of Sicily, um, they were caught up in a really bad storm. After all, it was late October, early November. <laughs> and um, the galleon apparently started to break up and they realized that they could not ultimately get it to Malta. And, and I can Gosh. imagine their frustration when they yeah. were so close and they were <laughs> like, ah, okay. So they transfer anything they can transfer from the galleon to their own galleys. And basically then they let it go to, to, to sink. Um, what's fascinating is that a few days later, a report reaches the Grand Master in Malta that on the eastern coast of Sicily, huge quantities of wood were, were washing up. The wood that, was, that had broken up from the galleon. Wow. And the Grand Master sends a delegation from Malta to Sicily to try and fetch as much of this wood as they could. Because again, in a pre-industrial world, you really don't want to waste anything that oh, you Oh, right. Used, okay. Okay. You know? They wanted to get this wood because they could use it themselves again. Ah, I didn't. Uh, I did, I thought you know driftwood would be no use, but I guess you can. You can put it to different use, especially because apparently when the galleon broke, um, there were still sizable chunks of it mm. that were relatively intact. Okay. So it's not just you know bits of plank, but mm. you know, apparently actually you know huge chunks of the sides and whatnot. Right. Right. Washed ashore. And uh, again, it's, um, you know, we often get the message today, reduce and reuse. They absolutely <laughs> went by it because, of course, they had far less resources, generally speaking, than, mm. than, than, than we. Um, anyway, they, they get to Malta. Um, fascinatingly, again, you see that they have a whole bureaucratic machinery in place. So all these clerks uh, go down with their ledgers and, and their, and their inkwills mm -hmm. and they start recording what they find what they see you know paperwork has always been important and, and that's how we know about it of course of course yep. um one of the things which is interesting is that um when that storm broke out the crew were feeling really desperate uh they thought they might drown and it's it's worth noting that few sailors knew how to swim um, which is one of those paradoxes. Yeah, that seems bizarre. It is. It is swimming is ve a very recent, relatively speaking, uh, skill wow. that, that you know it, more and more people know, including people who were at sea. Um, so you know, if you were at sea, you would drown if, if your vessel went down. So if the ship went down, that was kind of it for you, unless you could pretty much unless to you another managed boat. to yeah yeah get onto a rescue boat wow. or, or maybe cling to a bit of wood or, 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 or something. Mm. I mean, it's not that obviously there were those who knew how to swim, but not everyone, um, which is, I always find fascinating. Bizarre, and yeah. Kind of way. <laughs> so what happens, uh, because they are in despair, they ask for the intercession, they pray for the intercession of the Virgin Mary, which of course was very typical of the Catholic world. When they make it home safely to Malta, uh, one of the top priorities then is to um, uh, live up to the promise they had made to the Virgin Mary, uh, what we call a votive promise. So because the Virgin Mary, they believed, had helped them to get home, they would then offer some kind of thanksgiving, which could be, it could be simply uh, paying for a few masses, or they might commission a painting, or they might not in this case, but you know, in some real extravagant cases, even commission a whole chapel, for instance. Right. In, in, in Thanksgiving. 
it's wonderful when they commissioned the painting because that gives us a visual mm. of what happened. I mean, it's not perfect, of course, but often these paintings would are, are we call them history history drawings, in fact, because often they will picture a moment of the event. Mm, a bit uh, of a snapshot. Absolutely, and that's wonderful for us. Unfortunately, they don't do it in this case, but um, but they do offer their Thanksgiving. Uh, and also, there's all these clerks are really busy because, as I told you, the galleon was so rich in its prize that they had to record everything, and also, it was important to make sure that the that the price uh, captured was distributed as equally as possible among the different members of the crew, mm-hmm. or at least that they give the appearance that this is happening. And now it always got more than the average multi sailor, of course. <laughs> the way of it. But you know, they really wanted to give a feeling that everyone was getting their 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 due. Uh, now. Back to the Sultan, Ibrahim, um, as I told you, he was really upset by the whole episode. Uh, different European ambassadors who are in Constantinople at this point are reporting back to their masters in Europe that the Sultan is really upset, that he's mobilizing his forces. He was very upset with Venice because he felt that the Venetians had collaborated in this whole thing. The Venetian ambassador in Constantinople kept saying to him, no, it's not our fault. These guys just, you know, entered a bay without our permission. We can't police every single bay on the island. Mm. Uh, and you know, you know what they're like, he told him, because the Venetians didn't like the knights very much either. Mm. Uh, he told, you know, you know what they're like, they're, they're brigands, they're, they're pirates, they do whatever they want. They're always causing problems. You know, it's, it's really not our fault. But the Sultan still, still kept raging. Um, however, the general opinion was that this expedition that he was putting together was going to attack Malta. And uh, back here in Malta, by January 1645, the opinion was that, yes, Malta was going to be the target, uh, that Malta was going to have another great siege, like 1565. Um, and so they had to, to, to start preparing. Um, and what, you, what I notice when you look at the documents that are describing all of this um, are two things. They are afraid. And, and I think that shows that they were not fools because mm. you would have been a fool not to be afraid that the Ottomans were coming for you. Mm. This is a massive empire with massive resources. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. Exactly. <laughs> 100 years later, right? Absolutely. They must have known that this this was going to be a risk if you attack this convoy, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but they still took it. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? So, so they are afraid. But the second um, sort of feeling that you really get is a sense of, of mission, a sense of destiny. Um, in the documents, they describe Malta as the bulwark of Italy and Christendom. A bulwark is a kind of fortification. Mm-hmm. Also, they're saying, you know, Malta is the fortress that is going once again to save Christendom, to save mm-hmm. Italy. Um, and they were determined to fight, determined to resist and ideally repulse the Ottomans. But should they fail to do that, um, they were going to go down in history as, as you know, an ending that is worth speaking of. Yeah, I'll say. Wow. songs about you. It, it, it's so palpable, mm. uh, their, their, their determination. Um, of course, fate is playing an important role here. They do see this as a Christian Catholic uh, kind of crusade. Mm. Against against the Muslims, against 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 the Ottomans. Um, now, they begin preparing for what they believe is going to be a siege, um, and there was a procedure, a very well established procedure in these cases. So, first of all, they declare what they called a general alarm. This was like their their uh, their buzzword. What a general alarm means is that um, they have very reliable intelligence from spies, that the Ottomans are preparing and that they're coming to Malta. And therefore, they need to mobilize resources. Uh, They need the Christian princes of Europe to send help. And they start sending out messages. 
and they need every knight that is able-bodied to come to Malta. And so they issue what they used to call the General Citation. The General Citation was a call to arms. Every knight that was capable, that was living beyond Malta, most of them were outside of Malta most of the time, in fact, uh, were called to, to the island. Um, and again, the language they use is, is quite evocative. They say, your mother is calling you <laughs> to her aid. The mother wow. being the order. And, and of course, they are her children. They have to come, like, you know, like generally, a, a son would protect his mother, no? Mm. That, that's, that, that sort of imagery. And, and this so, is related to that. Does this have bearing on the, the eight-pointed Maltese cross where each of the uh, points are, is represented by a different, uh, I guess, wing or regiment? I know there was an English uh, one. Uh, is that yeah, a- yeah. So one of the interpretations of the eight-pointed cross is that it represents the eight nations, as they right. call them, that, that are part of the order. So you have Italy, you have France, Auvergne, and so on. And, and that's exactly what's happening, Elliot. They're sending out uh, messengers and, and, and letters to knights in the different parts of Europe saying, uh, you know, this is the time of reckoning. You know what your duty is. You've mm-hmm. sworn an oath, a sacred oath uh, to, to, uh, to, to come mm-hmm. when the mother calls. Um, and therefore you, you need to mobilize. And, and many of them do. And what many of them do is also they, um, because this is not a single knight, very often he will take an entourage with him. He will try and uh, muster as many soldiers as he can. And he will also put pressure on his family members. Remember, most of them are important nobles. They have connections in the court. And, and therefore, they're putting pressure on the different kings and princes and so on to also mobilize uh, to come to Malta. Is there, is there pay involved or is everyone just expected to, you know, take, take the cost themselves? And if you get some plunder there, that'll be split or? Uh, yeah, that, that's a brilliant point. So, no, there is no pay expected because this is your duty. Mm. Um, the order will cover some of the expenses involved. But ideally, every knight should really cover his expenses and the expenses of the man he's going to bring with him. Wow. Many of them could afford it. Remember, they did come generally from quite rich families. So mm. probably they, they could manage that. Uh, of course, here in Malta, then, it was the responsibility of the order to feed them, to clothe them, and so on. But really, most of the cost, the expectation was that you would bear it because it was, it was your duty. Mm. Um, I'm quite a big fan of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, likewise, movies likewise. included. And, and you know, this particular moment always reminds me of when uh, the beacons are lit, mm. uh, Minas Tirith calls for help, and you have the wonderful scene of Aragorn running into the hall. Or, uh, at Edor, it pushes the doors open, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, you know, Gondor calls for <laughs> aid, and King Theoden replies, and Rohan shall answer. You know, yeah, I do love that one. I, I know it's it's a movie, but it's you know, powerful. It is, yeah, it is, yeah, it is something like that that is happening. Um, I find it fascinating that there's still such a big religious pull. I mean, this is after the Reformation; it's after um, you know everything, and there's still such a crusading mm-hmm. zeal because you know you picture the Crusades yeah, kind of and, and, petering and, and, out you know, in the 1400s or so, right? You know what's also fascinating to me? So the knights, of course, have sworn an oath and they come. Again, you know, a lot of them take it seriously and do come. Um, but there's also a lot of volunteers, many of them nobles again, who, hearing what's going to happen in Malta, uh, get organized out of their own pocket, uh, try and even put, uh, if possible, a small troop of soldiers together, and they come to Malta as volunteers to fight for the fate. Mm. So as you're saying, it, it's still a very religious era. It, it still plays a part. Plus, of course, you know, there's always been men, the guy who is really keen on adventure, on mm. fighting, and, 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 and things like that. So, so that's all playing, playing a role. Um, money is always an issue, because you did raise this. The order tried to be as careful as possible with its money, uh, like, like any government. Uh, it never feels it has enough, no? Uh, but it's clear that at this point, they, they do throw caution a bit to the wind, and they start spending a lot on fixing the fortifications on the island, and in particular on stocking up on food and ammunition. Because, of course, if you're going to have a siege, you cannot survive 
if you don't have the food, the water, uh, and the ammunition to be able to fight that. So there's massive quantities of all kinds of materials um, that, that, are, that are being shipped to the island as, as quickly as, as, as possible. Um, the Ottomans are doing the same, but of course the Ottomans have a huge empire mm. they can call upon. Uh, and in Constantinople, the preparations are, are pretty uh, frenzied. Um, in early 1645, uh, around, around May, if I recall correctly, um, they sail out of Constantinople. And I think it's a testament to how good the Ottomans were in, in guarding their intelligence. That even in those moments when the sail, uh, when the fleet is sailing out, everyone believes this fleet is coming to Malta. But then at at the, the, the sort of at the juncture, whatever it was most convenient for them, as they were sailing, as they were near the Greek coast, most of which was under their control anyway, they turn around and head to Crete. Oh, you're kidding. Right. Okay. Absolutely. So the Venetians on the island are caught practically unaware. Now, mind you, they had their own uh, defenses. They, they had wisely enough been fixing up things and so on. But um, they, they had not expected it. They had mm. not expected that Crete was going to be the target of, of the Ottomans. And so in late June 1645, uh, the Ottomans land on Crete, um, but it would take them till 1669, 24 years to ultimately um, take, Crazy. take the island. So um, you can imagine the, the, the feeling uh, back, back, back in Malta uh, when, when they start getting these, these, these messages. A wave of relief, I imagine. <laughs> um, it, it, it's different, uh, different feelings. Um, now, we can talk a bit about that, or, or maybe we want to talk a bit about the war more generally first. Uh, sure, sure. Let's go through the war generally, I suppose, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, obviously, just some general observations, because it's 24 years, so <laughs> mm. we need as many podcasts, probably. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, so, it's, it's 24 years, again, because remember, we're in a pre-industrial society, so they can't fight all the time. Much of the fighting tends to be concentrated in spring and summer. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas then, in other times of the year, you want to let your men probably go back to sow the fields and, mm -hmm. and do the work that, that is necessary there. Um, another point is that we call it the War of Candia, the War of Crete, and a lot of the fighting happens there. But actually, a lot of the fighting also happens all over the Aegean. Uh, so where you have the Greek coast, the Greek islands, uh, parts of Dalmatia. Um, so the battleground is actually very extensive. It's not limited to Crete uh, itself. Um, what the Ottomans wanted was to take Crete, which would have sealed one of the last major gaps in the eastern Mediterranean, which they did not control, uh, whereas Venice obviously wanted to hold on to it for the reasons we we talked about earlier. Um, Venice gets help from certain quarters, so the Pope regularly sends his, his fleet and his soldiers to help. Uh, other places like Modena, Tuscany also help from time to time. But it's really the Knights of St. John who are the most constant ally that the Venetians have. Almost every year in those 24 years, the fleet sailed out of Malta and went to the east to help um, the, the Venetians. So, you know, it's, it's a significant commitment that the knights mm. make to this. Um, the third point is that the Ottomans, when they land in June 1645, um, they're able to overpower much of the island of Crete quite quickly. Um, the main bone of contention was going to be the major city which, a bit confusingly, was also called Candia. So the island was called Candia, the main city was called Candia. Um, today it's Heraklion, uh, which is still the major island of, 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 the, of, of Crete. Uh, 
Uh, and really, most of these 24 years are spent fighting over uh, the town of, of Candia, of, of Heraclea. Now, how was the news received in Malta? Again, it takes a couple of weeks for, for the information to reach the island. Um, at first, the knights are weary. They think, you know, maybe this is just a decoy. Maybe the Ottomans are just harassing uh, Crete a little bit so that we put our guards down and then, woof, we see them attacking us. So, yeah, at first they're, they're very careful. However, by the middle of July of 1645, they're starting to realize that, no, we're not going to be the target, at least not now. Um, and so many of the resources that had been piling up in Malta uh, are able to be redirected um, to Venice so that they can use them uh, in Crete. A lot of those soldiers and knights that had come to Malta, um, they try to convince them to go and fight in Crete. They don't force them because they felt, I think rightly so, that they couldn't force them. After all, they had come with a certain mission in mm. mind. Uh, but, but there are incentives, both from Venice and from the Knights, uh, monetary incentives, to, to, you know, instead of going back home or whatever, you know, go and, and fight in Crete. And, and quite, a, quite a number of them do, especially those that were mercenaries. Um, the Knights, uh, again, are quite eloquent in this. They tell Venice, look, we're going to help you because this is your hour of need. But they also tell Venice, and I'll quote from a document here, you need to acknowledge the error of your ways in the ways that you have dealt with us and the ways you have dealt with the Ottoman tyrant. And you need to show the proper respect to the banner, the flag of the order. You know, so they're making a point here. They're saying, you know, you are trading with the Muslims. You are all right. about money. Uh, you know, and you criticize us because we fight the Muslims. Uh, but, you know... Um, History or, 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 or current events are showing that we are right and, mm. and you are wrong. You know, these are the bad guys and you should acknowledge them. There are always these kinds of exchanges between, between them, between the two sides. So you know, they're helping each other, but they're not the best of friends. Mm. <laughs> because, because Venice was more of a, a mercantile republic, wasn't it? It didn't have a huge army. It was just based on, they made their wealth through trade, right? Exactly. So... They don't have a large land force, a large terrestrial army. They do, of course, have a large navy. Uh, and you know, galleys could serve both purposes, both mercantile and mm. uh, belligerent. Mm. So, um, so they do have a huge, huge fleet, uh, which they will deploy in, in this conflict. Um, and I suppose perhaps the last point I would make in, in this section is... Um, that at the early stages of the war, uh, the Pope asks the order to come up with a strategy for how they can deal with this particular conflict, which again is significant. Now, the Pope is turning to them because he knows these are guys with a lot of experience mm -hmm. and knowledge. Um, and they come up with a kind of blueprint, uh, which, which I found very fascinating when I read. Um, they recognize that um, the Ottomans have far more resources than either the Knights or Venice. Uh, and in particular, they, realize, they, they, they are very conscious that the land forces of the Ottomans are superior, certainly numerically, but also probably in terms of, of strategy. What the Knights argue is the main advantage that Venice and the Knights can deploy is that their ships are better. And so the suggestion of the Knights is that as much as possible, the Ottomans should be met at sea. If you can stop the Ottomans from sending enough resupplying to Crete, obviously their land forces on Crete will have to surrender. Mm. So this is their main suggestion. Let's meet them where we are strongest, meet them at sea. And okay. let's try to, to, to stop resources getting to the island, and in that way, the, the siege can be, can be won. Um, and, and in a way, 
we, we're going to see a bit later, this, this in fact unfolds, this, this kind of strategy, although not as successfully as, as they would have wished. Um, by September of 1645, the Knights are pretty confident that Malta is safe. Um, no one in the logistic of those days, again, a pre-industrial society, no one would launch a fleet in the Mediterranean after September, especially one that has to cross half the sea. Mm-hmm. So once September um, is over... Because they know of the that, winds and weather, is that right? Because of the winds and the weather. They, they know that Malta is safe. And in fact, um, again, I'll quote you from, from their own words. Given that the weather at this time of the year, so September, um, and that there is no threat of an enemy invasion, we have decided to remove the chain from the port. And I, I think this is a nice little detail. So um, a way in which um, if, if you were a harbor town, you, you would try and resist the siege would be to place these huge floating iron chains across the, the mouth of your harbor. This was done back in Constantinople. Mm. Uh, I mean, ultimately, it falls in 1453, yes, but they had done it many times before and it had worked. And perhaps you recall Elliot, even in the Siege of Malta. I was going to say, I do remember that. Yep, yep. They, they also had a chain. So they, they redeployed the same strategy here. Mm-hmm. At the point, they had closed the mouth of the harbor with a big chain uh, to, to prepare themselves. Now, in September, they felt, okay, they're not coming. We can remove the chain. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's obviously an object, you know, big clunky object, but it's also very symbolic. It tells you that the island is safe and we can, and, and, and again, they're, they're, it's amazing how quickly they do this. They can shift from the defensive to the offensive. Mm, mm. You know, the battle hasn't come to us, but we're going to take it to mm. them. And, they're, and they're, they're rearing for it. Ready to roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, if we come to the battle itself on, on, on that day in June, um, Karaf, on his account of the battle, uh, noted that he was very eager to take the Maltese squadron to the vanguard of the wider fleet. So this was the Venetian and, uh, and fleet of the knights. He takes the fleet to the vanguard, therefore where the action is going to be the toughest, where the fighting is, is going to be most intense. Because he says, these are his words, he was confident that John the Baptist would be with him. John the Baptist is, of course, the patron saint of the order. They are dedicated to Mm. John the Baptist. Um, He pointed out that at at a critical moment in the battle, when when actually things weren't going too well for the knights and the Venetians, the direction of the wind changed. He, of course, says that the, that the wind changed miraculously, divine intervention. Of course. <laughs> that change of the wind was absolutely critical because suddenly it, 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 um, it flipped the situation. <clears throat> it put the Christian forces in an advantage over the Ottomans, um, and, and they're able to practically smash the whole Ottoman navy wow. in, in that encounter. Now, um, if... If one can recall what I said in the first episode, again, it's galleys, you, you maneuver them frontwards, you fire your cannons, and then you engage side by side, mm-hmm. boarding, and, and it's, it's hand-to-hand combat, effectively, mm. on, at sea. Um, the, the firing is very heavy, the, the fighting is very heavy, um, and there's a particular line in Carafa's account, which I really gives us, think, gives us a sense of, of how raw uh, this, this is. I mean, you know, I, I, I never want to glorify war because it is horrific. And I think it really brings it home. So at one point he says that these are his words. It was not possible to discern between the Christian and the Turk since the majority were almost naked. Wow. It, it's so intense. It's so visceral. At a point he says it was even difficult to know my men because in the melee, how can you tell? Mm, mm, it's just a scrum. It's a scrum. You know, bear in mind that most Mediterranean people, broadly speaking, were olive skinned, mm. dark hair. I mean, you know, physically, Maltese and the Turk are not that different. 
mm. unless it's, it's it's a trek from the mountains, as it were, where <laughs> they're a bit <laughs> more enough. long. But you know, it it, it it can be very difficult, and and it's very clear from what he's saying. And it's also clear that as if you're in charge, it's extremely challenging. Mm. How do you keep track of all this? How do you keep uh, order? Uh, he also notes that there were moments where discipline breaks down among your own men. And he has to very forcefully, you know, with his own person, reimpose discipline on his men, rally them so that they keep fighting uh, and fighting in, in the right way. The fighting was so intensive that the captain general of Venice, he was called Lorenzo Marcello, he is killed in battle. No one is spared in these engagements mm. from the highest to the lowest. So he is killed. Uh, obviously, someone steps in as next in command. And someone, and again, I find this fascinating how they manage to communicate. Someone brings a message to Carafa telling him, uh, Marcello has died. Uh, now there's a new person in charge. Carafa tells him, and again, we get a brilliant insight into their mentality. Um, Precedence and protocol was so important to them. He tells the new person in charge, he tells him, look, we're going to keep on collaborating now while we are in the midst of a battle. However, my instructions from Malta are very clear. I can only receive orders from the Captain General of Venice. He's dead. You are not occupying his office because wow. his title was different. Mm -hmm. so he said, I will not follow your orders. So obviously we'll get through this. But after that, uh, my instructions are very clear and I have to stick with them. I will not be following your orders because not being a captain general of Venice, his rank was not the equivalent of the captain general of the knights. So you get these issues of, you know, I can't take orders from someone who is effectively inferior to me in rank. Well, but, so even even if he's acting in the role, it's still not enough. It's exactly, uh, wow. exactly, exactly. So, so it's 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 fascinating. Um, anyway, the battle ends. It is a victory for the Venetians and the knights. Um, <clears throat> the descriptions are, again are are very strong. Uh, they describe an apocalyptic scene of burning and sinking vessels and floating corpses. And Carafa, in fact, noted that there was so much wreckage floating on, on, on the sea that it needed a lot of skill and caution to sail through without uh, damaging your own your own vessels or without getting entangled. In, in so just them. floating bits of debris mm -hmm. in the in the sea and, and corpses. Yes, oh, yes. Wow. It's, it's, it, it must have been absolutely mm. horrific to to, mm. to gaze upon. Um, the the booty or prize was very rich. That, that was gained from this. Uh, the knights capture uh, a couple of, of, of vessels, whole, whole vessels, which they will take back to Malta. <clears throat> they capture a lot of pieces of artillery, cannons, and, and they're particularly pleased because a lot of them are made of bronze rather than iron. Mm. Bronze cannon being far better than iron and more right. expensive. So that's always wonderful. Um, they capture, again, a lot of Muslim slaves. And in the reverse process, they free hundreds of Christian slaves that had been rowing on the Ottoman vessels. So, and this always happened. Some people earned their freedom. Some people became, became slaves. Now, at this point, um, the Venetian uh, leadership that was there and Carafa um, have a serious um, dispute, a serious fallout. Because a couple of Venetian bureaucrats, and it's quite telling that they use the word bureaucrats, they're, they're you know, quite dismissive. <laughs> Pen pushes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mind you, many of them were still warriors as well, but you know, they're seeing them with that hat. Uh, they go to Carafa and they tell him that the knights technically should hand over to Venice part of the spoils that they have captured. And Carafa is adamant. He says, no. <laughs> uh, and he tells them, and I'll quote you because it's such a wonderful phrase. 
Once the banner of St. John flutters from atop a vessel, that vessel cannot pass to any other sovereign. It's, it's a, I find it so fascinating. Yeah, it's really this like is, flowery, you know, words, yeah, right? Uh, this is diplomacy at sea. This is Carafa saying, I am the representative, not just of the religious order, I am the representative of the Grand Master as a Prince of Malta, mm. as a sovereign. And I am not bowing to this. No one is going to uh, entrench or, or rather step into any of, of, of my sovereignty. Um, the Venetians also uh, say to, to Carafa, look, you have liberated about, this is staggering, 1,200 Christians that had been rowing on the Ottoman galleys. Um, the Venetians tell him, you need to hand over half of those to us. But Carafa replies that, again, it's quite wonderful, he cannot place into slavery those that he was duty-bound to set free. So he says to the Venetians, you know, over my dead body, I'm not handing over even one. Uh, eventually, the Venetians say, okay, we will settle for 300. So Carafa goes to these freed Christians and he tells them, if any of you want to go to, to the Venetians, you can. Otherwise, my promise to you is that I will take you to Malta and from Malta then you can make your way home to wherever your home uh, is. Uh, and we're told that about 200 go over to the Venetians. Most of them were Greeks who lived in territories controlled by Venice. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it made sense for them um, mm. to do that. But I think it's just wonderful how Carafa yeah. steps in and has these... Now, again, he might have uh, edited a bit his comments later, but it, the spirit of it is absolutely intact. That it... This is our sovereignty. This is what we do. We've been helping you, and, you know, I'm not going to give up anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to real... sail back to Malta with all of this. <laughs> a real sense of destiny, right? You know, like, this is, this is oh, how it's going to be, and um, there's not yeah. really much you can yeah. do about it. <laughs> so uh, they sail back to Malta. The news reaches Malta before uh, they get back to the island. Um, as I told you, the Grand Master at the time... Uh, I'll tell you his full name. It's one of those long ones again. Jean-Paul de Lascaris Castellar. Beautiful. We'll just go with Lascaris. <laughs> um, he was sick. Um, I don't know what, what his issue was, but he was pretty sick. He was in bed. And he was so sick that they had actually upon, appointed a lieutenant to uh, basically carry out his duties. Um, you know, technically... You can't have a grandmaster as long as one is still alive, so that's why they appoint a, a lieutenant. However, uh, on the 17th of July, 1656, um, the lieutenant goes to the grandmaster, who was in, in bed sick, to tell him the good news, to tell him that they had scored this amazing victory. And we're told that the sick grandmaster, and again, I'll quote it to you because it's so beautiful. So the sick grandmaster erupted with devout joy, speaking the words of Holy Simeon, Non dimittis servum tuum domine, which means, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. Wow. It's a beautiful bit of drama, isn't it? So he so, gets so, up out of his deathbed almost and just uh, exactly. speaks Latin. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, maybe to explain it to your, to your listeners, the Simeon that he's referring to, uh, is this figure in the in the New Testament? Um, he was a priest in the temple, who, when Mary and Joseph took the baby Jesus to the temple uh, for for his his the the, 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 the traditional rituals, uh, Simeon erupted uh, with this phrase: "Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, because my eyes have seen your salvation." Right. Basically, Simeon had extracted a promise from God that God would not let him die before he would see Jesus. And so uh, this Nung Dimittis, as it comes to be known, is very famous, is very powerful. 
So you can imagine this grandmaster getting out of his bed. He's so sick, but then he erupts into in the nung dimitis. God, now that you have see, shown me your glory, I am ready to depart this world. Wow, that is it, powerful. It, 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 it's splendid. He lives another year, um, uh, but but he's clearly basking in the glory of this. Mm. He's, he's, he's so pleased. It, it, it is, as he saw it, as they saw it, a sign of God's blessing mm. and, and, and approval. Um, now, the fleet finally makes it to Malta on the 31st of July, 1656. Besides themselves, I think they had about six galleys, they drag to Malta 11 captured vessels. Wow. I mean, it's astounding. Mm. <laughs> um, when, when you had this kind of event, what they would do is that they would get all the cannons on the fortifications in the harbor uh, to fire salutes. So you imagine this fleet approaching and all these guns are firing. It, it, they use the word thundering, in fact. Hmm. It's like the sound of thunder in, in the air. Uh, and, uh, and people are lighting bonfires and torches. So it's, it's, it's a splendid um, reception. Hmm. Um, the galleys sail in front of the mouth of the harbor, but then they, they go into... Uh, Mar Samshet, which is the second harbor. They do this because the rules said that any vessel that came from the east had to first go into Mar Samshet, the second harbor, where they had the quarantine facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was very important to them. There was always the fear of plague. And plague right. tended to come from the east. So they very rarely made an exception, not even in this case. Mm. Uh, if you came from the east, first of all, you had to spend a period in quarantine, which usually was 40 days. So, sometimes they, they would make you spend a bit less or a bit more, but, but quarantine was absolutely essential. Uh, you had people who were known as commissioners for public health, and it was down to their judgment how long or short the period of quarantine had to be. Wow. And I think coming hopefully out of the, the I was COVID just about to say I've got a I've got my own. we can really relate to this, <laughs> no? Quarantine and and, 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 and the, the, the role of, of people like commissioners for public health, how, how important that is. Uh, once this is over then they get on with the celebrations because obviously this merited a big party. Mm. Um, they uh, intone the Te Deum Laudamus in the churches. The Te Deum Laudamus is a very important Christian hymn of praise and thanksgiving. They don't just do it in Malta. From Malta, they send messages to all their knights and representatives of the order across Europe, telling them, we've just had this amazing victory. We want you to sing the Te Deum Laudamus thanksgiving to God in our churches across Europe and we want you to go to the princes to the kings to the nobles and tell them what's happened and make sure that from the farthest corner of Spain to the farthest corner of, of Germany everyone knows about this and, and it, 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 it's, it's fascinating to see how the news spreads they also publish pamphlets and, and you know they want Europe to know that they're yeah. doing the good fight it's so, I mean, important. this was obviously a huge, this was the third battle of the Dardanelles, was it? Absolutely. A yes. And you, you mentioned before the first one was the Ottoman victory. The second one was a Venetian. Is that right? Yes. But, and this but, was, uh -huh. this but, was again, a Venetian knight's victory. Right. But obviously the biggest one out of the, the two they've had so far, right? Uh, what? As it would turn out, it's the biggest of the whole four. Really? Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have an interesting letter from a knight uh, who was called Valerio Spreti, and he was based in Venice. He was like the representative of the order in Venice. So, of course, he's quite important in all of this mm. goings on. And he sends a, 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 a letter to the Grand Master say, saying to him that in Venice, everyone is so happy with the outcome of the battle, that they are so grateful to the knights for having played such a pivotal role in all of this. And he says that all over the city, there are people gathering in corners uh, and basically getting drunk, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, cheering Malta, apparently shouting, Viva Malta, Viva Malta. Wow. Um, um, 
Now, he might have been exaggerating a little bit, but you do it's get a, a story, sense yeah. that, uh, that even in Venice itself, obviously they were happy about the overall victory and happy that the Knights had given them this, this, this big helping hand in, mm. in all of that. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's amazing. You see why I wanted to speak about it. I can definitely <laughs> see, yeah, yeah. I was curious to know, I read online that um, there was a few points during the 24-year war that there were some terms offered to the Venetians, such as letting them keep the island but pay tribute. Was this? Did one of these occur after this victory? Or um, While the war is going on, there's also negotiations, as you rightly point out. And so from time to time, you would get these kinds of exchanges between the Venetians and the Ottomans, uh, where, yes, they might say, you know, well, we'll let you keep perhaps two or three towns, the Venetians, whereas the rest of the island will be Ottoman, uh, and so on. Um, the Knights, through, for example, someone like Sprede, who was in Venice, would keep a very close ear for these goings-on. Mm. They tried to discourage them as much as possible, because you know, they thought that you know, we want to win this war, we don't want to negotiate with the enemy. Mm. Uh, in the end, none of these ever came to, to fruition. Uh, the war would end... With Venice uh, having to having to um, seed seed the, the the town and, and the island, and and in fact this would be the last part of, of our discussion. So I, I thought we could say something about the last stages of the War of Candia, uh, and maybe a bit more about our key protagonist Carafa. I sure, sure. It, just more. just before we get there, do you mind if uh, I ask about? Because I was reading that on Dalmatia, it was kind of the opposite was happening while um, Crete was slowly being taken to the point where it was just the the, the fortress of Candia being left on Dalmatia, yeah, the yeah. Venice and the Knights were making some progress against the Ottomans. Is that right? Uh, yes. You, um, as I said um, earlier, the fighting wasn't just restricted to, to Crete. We saw the battles of the Dardanelles, but there were battles all along the Greek and Dalmatian uh, coasts and, and islands. Um, and as you say, in some places the, the, the Ottomans were losing ground, in other places it was the Venetians. So the picture was complex and varied, mm -hmm. depending on the place and the time over the whole of the 24 years. Um, and I believe at the end, although the Venetians lose Crete, um, they partially compensate for it by having gained a couple of other territories on the Greek, Dalmatian, mainland or, 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 or islands. Right, right. But of course, the price had been Crete. Um, mm. that, that's what it had been about. Um, so the year after this third battle of the Dardanelles, that we went into a bit of detail, um, there is the fourth one in 1657, July 1657. Um, again, Venice and the Knights trying to blockade the Dardanelles and the Ottomans trying to, to break out. Uh, Carafa's there again, so this was his, his second intervention. Um, and it really seemed to be going well for the Christian side because uh, they had already destroyed a lot of Ottoman shipping. Um, the Venetian captain general was called Lazzaro Mocenico. He was a, again, a very interesting character, very enterprising. Having smashed a lot of the Ottomans' uh, ships, he took his galley and another 11 ones and attempted to enter the Straits of the Dardanelles. So effectively, he was engaging now the land fortresses. What he wanted to do was hit Constantinople. Uh, and he thought he would get there. Unfortunately, he threw caution a bit too much to the wind, and as he was pushing in, and it really seemed that things would go his way, someone from one of these land fortresses, Ottoman land fortresses, fired a cannon shot, and, and this projectile hit Mochenigo's galley, which was therefore the main one, and as fate would have it, that, that, that single projectile hit the gunpowder deposit on Mochenigo's uh, vessel. And as you can expect, the whole thing went up in flames. It was a big, big, big explosion. 
the whole vessel was destroyed. Wow. Mochanigo was killed. Uh, it's estimated that between four to 500 uh, men that were on board died oh. in, in that explosion. It's, it, it's horrific. Mm. Uh, with maybe 100 to 200 saving themselves uh, from it. Um, and so, and, and then the action kind of stops. So you can see why both sides can claim it as a victory. The Venetians had succeeded again in that year to smash most of the Ottoman vessels and to largely stop them uh, sending reinforcements to Crete. But their captain general and the main vessel had gone up in a spectacular way. Mm. And it really, really hit the morale, <clears throat> the morale of the Venetians and the knights and the, pope, uh, the papal forces that were there as well. And I think it's telling that you don't get something like this um, episode again. No, th there wasn't a fifth Battle of the Dardanelles mm -hmm. or, or so on. Um, it, 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 I think it's really um, um, emblematic of the whole war. This one, one big loud explosion that, mm. that, that brings down so dramatically um, Mochenigo and, and his, his, his ship. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating to think of what would have happened if he did make his way all the way up the, you know, the Golden Horn, the Dardanelles. And actually... I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's amazing. Um, now, the War of Candia continues till September 1669. Uh, in that year, France sent uh, troops to help the Venetians. Um, it's really the first time that it did so in the whole war. And the fact that France had, as it were, you know, put its muscle into it, um, gave the Venetians a glimmer of hope that perhaps this might actually end the war successfully for them. Um, but in the end, it was futile, and the French left after a while, <clears throat> the knights leave as well, um, and what was left was a small, very, very depleted force in, in, in Candia City, in Heracleon, which surrenders on the 6th of September, um, 1669. Mm. Uh, and that, that brings the war to, to an end. I read, um, um, I read mm -hmm. online that there were some <clears throat> disagreements between the Maltese and the French forces when they got there, and that's, they left early because of that. Is there any truth to that? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, just like that episode earlier where, where Carafa was disagreeing with the Venetians, uh, disagreements between these what were meant to be the allies, no? Mm. <clears throat> um, happened all the time, often around issues of precedence and protocol. Right. Who should move first? Whose banner should be in the lead? Who should uh. be on the left? Who should be on the right? Which might sound rather silly to us. Um, but again, we have to understand their mentality. They are formed by this mentality. Mm. And for them, they were important things. Mm. Um, you know, I suppose the equivalent would be someone telling us today to give up our mobile phone for mm. whatever reason. I mean, we often take it very personally. It's honor, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, which it's probably quite silly, actually, but in reality, it is important to us, and and, and we make a point about it. Um, if you look in the archives of the Knights of Malta, which, which are here in Malta, um, <clears throat> there are. Um, the technical word would be folios, but you know, it's pages, pages and pages of, of you know, volumes full of details about this war, as you can imagine, over mm. 24 years. Um, and then I found it very poignant when I came across what is probably the, the, the last entry that they have about this, which is on the 4th of December of 1669. So although the surrender is in September, they're still talking about it. Uh, for a couple of months until the 4th of December. Um, and it goes like this. We have received a letter from Venice telling us about the peace between them and the Turk. And that's it. That's it. Wow. That's it. That's it's really poignant, isn't washing it? the hands of it, really. It's just yeah, uh, yeah. nothing it's else like to It's like saying, say. we've done our part. Mm. We've paid a high price in men and resources. That's it. It's done. Um, we we are going to move to other chapters now, as, mm. as, as, as it were. 
I, 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 yeah, I find it quite powerful in its uh, simplicity. Yeah, it's um, I, I guess it's at the end of the day, there's not much else more else to say apart exactly. from that, right? I yeah. read the the surrender itself. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was negotiated just by the, um, I suppose, the commander on yeah. on Heraklion. Yeah. He he wasn't in communication with maybe the Venetian mainland and the Maltese mm-hmm. knights. Is that right? Uh, yes. In the end, it was up to him. Um, I hope I'm recalling the correct name. I believe it was Morosini. Um, yeah. But then again, how you can't blame the man. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> he as at the end of his resources he's largely alone mm. uh, venice is ultimately far away uh and he was a very experienced military leader himself and mm. uh, I, I, he 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 would have read this the, the the writing on the wall now that there was no point in carrying on um what i mean what would have happened had they kept, tried to kept fighting and, and the ottomans coming by force? they would have massacred everyone Mm. Uh, at least uh, they lived to fight another day, uh, mm. as it were. Obviously, back in Venice, um, and again, you can see the point of view of the political leadership, a, a surrender, a defeat never looks good. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it was very, very complicated in, in that sense as well. So Crete's annexed by the Ottomans, and it stays that way until virtually Greek independence. Is that right? Um, I, yes, exactly. So it would um, uh, become part of the modern Greek state then in the 19th century, if I'm not mistaken, but a bit late as well, some, some, somewhere around the uh, 1870s, 1880s, mm. um, as part of the wider political machinations that were happening at that time, uh, the key figure being the German Chancellor Bismarck, mm. uh, who was moving the chess pieces very much at that point in time yeah yeah mm, so, fascinating yeah it's uh... it is it is um maybe we'll say one last word about carafa um sure. our, our protagonist um you know in many ways he was very typical of, of someone who would be a knight of malta um he came from a noble family uh his family the carafa were a very very powerful family in southern italy uh, with strong Spanish uh, connections. And uh, with these kinds of families, it was the routine, practically, that they would seek to enroll at least one of their sons into the Order of St. John. He was born on the 17th of March, 1615. His father lodged the application, as it were, for his membership just 12 days later. <laughs> wow. Which, uh, again, was fairly common. You would have to go to the Pope to ask for what is called a dispensation, like a special permission. Uh, But it's not unusual. Um, Usually the formula was that your firstborn male is going to inherit the titles and the lands and so on. Other sons would need, uh, you would need to find venues or careers for them. Mm. A very good choice was to enroll them uh, in, in the Order of St. John. And what's fascinating, and again, he was quite typical here. So his father is enrolling him as a younger son into the Knights of Malta. Uh, at the same time, there was an uncle of his who was a member that is the brother of his father. So uh, Gregorio's father and his brother had went through the same, same kind right. of procedure, no? Uh, Gregorio's father was the firstborn. He inherited the title and lands. His younger brother had been enrolled in the order, and this was repeating itself. So it was very um, much a family affair. To yeah, a 12, yeah. Twelve-day-old night. Know, one one subject which I'd love to study one day, but it's very tricky, is this relationship between the uncle and nephew mm. in the order, because mm. you find it very often that you you join and you find you have your uncle who is already there which is helpful in many ways because mm. you have someone who's going to look out for you, hopefully of most of the time, because <laughs> uh, there's always the odd wicked uncle. No? But most <laughs> of the time, uh, they do look out for them. They do kind of train them, take them under their wing. Um, and in fact, um, uh, obviously I said he was enrolled at 12, year, at 12 days, uh, but it doesn't mean they sent him off to Malta that young. Mm. They would keep him with the family still. 
Um, and he received a, a very good education, very humanistic kind of education, as we said earlier, all these classical uh, references. But also he received, uh, as was the way, a, a very good military training. Um, we see him quite early on, because he was quite young, traveling with his uncle, the knight, uh, to go to Catalonia. He spends a bit of time there. Again, the family has strong links to Spain. <clears throat> He returns to, to South Italy, to Naples. Uh, we find him in 1647 involved in, in a very interesting episode in the history of Naples. It's called the Revolt of Masaniello. Masaniello was um, a fisherman, essentially, who led this very um, glorious kind of revolt against the Spanish overlords of the city. It all ends horribly for Masaniello. Uh, but we find uh, Gregorio Carafa, he was there, and he was there defending the establishment. So right. In the revolt. Um, and just a few years later, in 1651, we find him being accused that he was aware of a plot against the Viceroy of Naples. So he wasn't involved in the plot, but he knew of it and had not reported it. Right. So, again, these are powerful families uh, maneuvering against each other. As punishment, he was exiled to Spain for a couple of years, which, again, you know, you're talking about what kind of punishment was it? The family has connections in Spain. He, he wasn't in, in prison or anything. It'd be a holiday. <laughs> he still had led a fairly good life, but, of course, it was still a punishment, and there is an element of humiliation to it. Mm. Uh, in 1655, he comes back to Naples, and that's when he makes his way to Malta. So really up to that point, although he was a knight, he hadn't really contributed much to the order itself, mm. which again is typical of the career of these men. It doesn't mean that you would necessarily spend all your life fighting and working for, mm. for the order. Um, so he comes back in 1655. He is given command of the fleet as captain general. And, and that's where we saw him then having this tremendous success at the third battle of the Dardanelles. So mm -hmm. immediately he proves his mettle um, with his superiors in, in the order. In fact, there were many who believed that on the strength of that success, he was um, a very good candidate to be Grand Master. Wow, okay. Um, however, he has to wait till 1680. There were others before him who, who got the office, but in 1680, um, he does become Grand Master. Oh, no kidding, okay. Um, and he's in power for a decade. Um, another reason why I like him, because it's so easy to remember his years in power, 1680, <laughs> 1690. <laughs> um, and he leads the order, uh, again, to quite a complicated uh, decade where European politics are super complicated. There is all the issues with the different wars that Louis XIV is, is, is involved in across Europe. Uh, all these coalitions forming against the French, um, and he's trying to steer the order through all of this. Uh, plus, in 1684, so when he is Grand Master, uh, a new war breaks out between Venice and the Ottomans, which is called the War of the Morea. Um, that's quite a long one, again, because it will last till 1699. Um, the theater of war is once again very similar it's, it's around Crete, around the Greek islands, right. Dalmatia. Um, and once again, uh, Carafa, probably recalling his own experience, is very keen to send out the forces of the order to help Venice. Mm. And that's another whole fascinating podcast yeah, one could have yeah, about sure. the War of the Morea. Um, it's quite successful for Venice. They gain a lot of territory from the Ottomans mm. in Greece and Dalmatia in these years. At a point, they're even saying, ooh, maybe this is the chance to get Creed back. Wow, um, it got to that almost, did it? But um, that was a little bit over the top, and, and, mm. and they failed to, to do that. Um, back on the island, he, he also uh, sponsored a lot of um, architectural works, both military um, and civilian. So even today, you can still see quite a bit of the physical imprint uh, that Carafa left left behind which would bring me which would bring me to the conclusion <laughs> yeah that was uh what a what a life i'll tell you what he's really it sounds like he was 
lives a life of a bit of an adventurer until being really defined by this conflict and then mm. rising up through the through the order because of it almost on the on the prestige yeah. that he gained. What I like about these men as well is is their very holistic formation, mm. uh, which I find often is, is missing from many of our politicians whenever you look. Uh, they appreciated the importance of a good, solid, solid humanistic education mm. that you know you know your classical texts, that you know your history. Uh, they are also good when it comes to military strategy. Uh, now, I'm not saying that every politician has to be a general first, but having a bit of life experience, having a, a, a depth of history, which you can then bring to your political office, um, I, I think is, is important. And, and they did perform rather well, not all of them, of course, but many of them performed quite well on the strength of having lived and gained experience mm. uh, on top of a solid education that, that, that they can bring to, to office. Yeah, and um, it seemed like really, really stood for something as well, didn't he? It wasn't just yeah. uh, the education and the and the training that he had. It was about uh, having obviously something in his heart for for the order and you know the the legacy of this body that he's representing. I suppose. Absolutely. Um, perhaps to conclude, um, I have another little quotation from from Please. the archives, which which I think is quite nice. Um, so this is 16 November, 1669. In other words, just after uh, Candia has surrendered. Um, and the order in Malta is getting all these reports that the Turks, the Ottomans, having taken Candia, are already mobilizing for something else. So they're getting this intelligence. And they're, they're thinking in Malta, okay, Maybe now it's going to be our turn. And maybe, you know, now they've taken Crete. They're, they're already doing this. Um, and what they're saying here in Malta is that, look, we have to keep our eyes open and our ears open. Um, we cannot underestimate the Ottomans. Okay? You know, never underestimate the enemy. Never, never be overconfident. But we will be ready. No matter what comes, I like I it. I think it's, it's, that, it's that, a that's the quote: is that we'll be ready no matter what comes. It's a very uh, wait for part two kind of ending for a TV show, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, I love yes. that. Um, and you know, the knights are here till seventeen ninety eight, uh, ultimately, and there's going to be a handful of other episodes where they 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 really believe that the Ottomans are coming for them. Mm. Um, and each time they mobilize and each time there is that spirit of, you know, let's not be fools. This mm. is scary, uh, but we will be ready. And if it is the end, then it will be an end that everyone will speak of. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. they're, always, they're always coming back to that. It seems like there was always that we're ready to go down in history kind of thing. We saw uh -huh. it in the, um, the, you know, the great siege that they're famous for. And yeah. apparently... All these subsequent ones after, just ready to roll, right? Well, I think when you consider that, um, you know, if you're joining this organization, you would have been very aware of its history, mm. 1565 and all the other battles that would have come before you are joining. Plus, you know, we said like Carafa, there's a good chance that there's been your ancestors in this as well. So likely you've heard the stories even back home when you were still in the lap of your mother and father. Mm. Um, I, I don't think you can escape that, uh, that, that kind of formation, uh, both mental and, and physical, um, which, which then explains this kind of attitude when they feel that, you know, a threat, a siege might be upon us. Mm. The glory of it, in a way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It continues. <laughs> For sure. All right. Um, well, look, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Budajit, I certainly appreciate you coming on the show and kind of helping me out with this and um, really giving me a lot of education about what the Knights, well, one of the many activities the Knights were engaged in um, after 1565. So thanks very much. And um, my pleasure. Yeah, I um, look forward to speaking to you again. Um, and if you make your way to Malta in May or, or whenever, I'd be happy to meet up. Uh, oh, fantastic. Yeah, it would be good to know. 
someone. <laughs> so that's great. Fun, funnily, a lot of people are planning to come in May. I've been hearing it from, from you know, different contacts and so on. I, I, I don't know, may, may, maybe restrictions all over the place yeah. are, are going down around there. I don't know. I think that's a general <laughs> thing. Everything's lifting. Everyone wants to travel and they look for a place yeah, with yeah. sun and they go right yeah. straight to Malta. Well, May is usually a lovely time to visit anyway. Oh, fantastic. Uh-huh. Yeah, great. It would be great if we could.